Hello and welcome. I'm Will Willeman and I'm your host for today. And uh, I've got a new book out, Don't Look Back, Methodist Hope for What Comes Next. And that's going to be the focus of today's webinar. For the past six months, I have been interviewing hundreds of Methodists across North America and asking them questions around uh, what's happening in your local situation, uh, how are you relating to stresses within the denomination, and what's our hope uh, for the future. And this webinar will explore some of those questions with leaders from different perspectives. We're going to have a denominational leader and uh, church advisor, and we're going to have a, a local church pastor and also a seminary student to talk with me about the book and about some of the issues related uh, to the book. So welcome. Uh, first, we're gonna talk with the Reverend Dr. Douglas Poe, uh, Jr. Uh, Doug is an ordained elder in Baltimore, Washington Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, and he is director of the Lewis Center for Church Leadership where he is James Logan Professor of Evangelism at Wesley Theological Seminary. Uh, and just to say that I, in preparation for this book, I found the work of the Lewis Center, Douglas, to be just marvelous. And I commend it to any of you that may not know about the Leading Ideas podcast uh, that Doug uh, puts together that's just fabulously helpful. Uh, two pastors in this present moment. Uh, Doug's new book is Sustaining While Disrupting. Love that title. Uh, the Challenge of Congregational Innovation. And that book was just released a few weeks ago. So welcome, Doug. Bishop, thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate your lifting up our podcast of which you participated and the new book, which of course is by a friend of yours, uh, Lovett Weems. So I want to also lift up my co-author. I think uh, Lovett Williams has been a mentor to the both of us along the way. And, Absolutely. Uh, I am grateful. You know, one of the things I say in the book uh, that I hope is encouraging to church leaders in the present moment, that it seems to me there are more resources available to help us lead the church, maybe than we have ever had in the whole history of the church. If you count up all the podcasts, and all the people who are helpfully working on helping us to think through the present moment and which direction we ought to go. And you're certainly one of that. Now, the folks at uh, Amplify Media have uh, lifted a number of quotes from the book as a way of stimulating our discussion. Here's the first one I'd like you to respond to. This is from the book. Most people in congregations have never heard of the Council of Bishops. They can't name their bishop and have never run across a real live member of general conference. I think in their unconcern for the church beyond their congregation, they may have things in proper perspective. Um, Douglas, what did I mean when I said that? <laughs> well, first, let me say I really appreciated the book and the way that you went about constructing it in a very balanced way. Uh, what did you mean when you wrote that quote? <laughs> uh, here's, here's what I think you meant when you wrote that quote. I think um, first that it is really important for individuals to focus on the mission of the local congregation. And that if individuals are focusing on the mission of the local congregation, that actually is going to help the denomination as a whole. Um, the, the, the challenge is that when we start thinking about sort of institutionalism, we lose sight of that our first calling, our first vocation is actually to transform the lives in the community where our churches reside. Um, so by focusing on our local congregation, we actually have the right perspective of what our calling is. The truth of the matter is, and, and you, you know this, most individuals um, aren't thinking about the bishop except for when either the bishop appoints a pastor 
or the bishop removes a pastor. And in most cases, um, they're angry with the bishop when the pastor they like leaves. And they're angry with the bishop when they a bishop appoints a pastor they don't like. But for the, for, for the most part, um, for most people, the bishop really isn't a thought. Their focus is on their local congregation and what they can do to make sure that their local congregation stays vital. You know, in your work, Douglas, I've, I've felt that theme uh, focus has been a theme of yours. Uh, and I must say, I, I say this in the book, I, I think for Methodist, United Methodist, uh, for some time, um, the general church can be, for the local congregation, uh, a distraction. We can get, we can maybe give too much power to who the bishop is, what the bishop is doing or not doing, uh, to what general conference ought to do, might do, should do. And that can be distracting. In, in the book, I give an instance of my own experience visiting preacher in a local congregation, median, the average attendance is about 30. And um, the average age of the congregation, from what I could tell, seems to be about 65. And after church, I was meeting with leadership of the congregation, as I often asked to do. And I asked the leadership, which consisted uh, of six older women, about my age. <laughs> and I asked them, well, what is the biggest challenge you face in this congregation? And the church, they responded, our biggest challenge is the Methodist church. And I said, oh, in what way? And they said, well, when they chose to ordain that uh, lesbian bishop out west somewhere, they made it a lot harder here for us. And I, I didn't say it, <laughs> but I thought it. Are you kidding me? Uh, this, this congregation, from what I see, will not be here in about five or six years. And you're telling me that the actions of some Methodists across the country that you don't approve of, those actions are hindering you in some way from being the church here? Uh, so I like your emphasis on focus. Uh, you know, in your new book, Douglas, you, you talk about, uh, I, lo I love that image, sustaining while disrupting. Uh, or is it disrupting while sustaining? A anyway, uh, the two go together, these this, this two uh, seemingly paradoxical uh, things. Um, I think that's, we got to figure out how to both lead in a disruptive time in the church, but maybe in your book you suggest about how we, we may also need to be leaders of disruption in this particular time in order this is, well, here's a quote um, that I had in my book. Uh, Say what you will about the Book of Discipline's dated rigidity, but to tell the truth, the discipline of the United Methodist Church gives more flexibility, adaptability, and opportunity for creativity than most congregations have had the courage to use. Do you, how do you react to that statement? I think the answer is, um, for most people, it's sort of a both and. Um, the discipline gives a lot of flexibility in terms of ministry and mission, which mm -hmm. should be our focus, you know, so that if someone is looking to simplify their structure, as you know, you can go to sort of a one board model to try to make sure that you're focused on um, really trying to say what our goal is, is to create the best possible structure so that we can make sure that we're making a difference in our community. The challenge, Bishop, I think, and, and this is the, the <clears throat> piece that um, is a struggle in the denomination right now, is we've started focusing and thinking of the discipline in terms of codifying positions um, theologically. And that's where sort of um, people don't see it as flexible. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where the, the challenge comes in. And so you have individuals, of course, who believe the discipline should 
um, you know, be strictly adhered to um, and in instances and people say we need to change it because it, it's not right because it's dehumanizing individuals. Um, and the, and that's where the conflict occurs and people don't see it as flexible of a book. In terms of, in the focus of your book, in terms of mission, absolutely flexibility um, and the focus of congregations. The challenge is as leaders, how do we navigate the, the challenge theologically while at the same time helping our people still focus on mission? The reality of, of that challenge, of course, is um, we have individuals separating um, as we uh, move into um, individuals leaving what we now call the United Methodist Church because um, they believe they can fulfill the mission uh, moving out. But I think correctly you point out issues are still going to go with you. It's not like those issues are going to disappear and you're still going to have to find a way as a leader to try and make sure you're keeping your eye on the mission. That's always going to be the challenge in front of us and has always been the challenge historically for the church is with all the other stuff going on, how do you stay focused on making sure as a leader you're helping to lead your people towards the mission? Yes. Uh, You're absolutely right about how the, the discipline we have started and I would I date this about 75 years old, about as old as I am. But uh, we started making the book of discipline into a legalistic codifier of behavior and something that had, had not been before. And we started drawing up rules, uh, rules for how you do this and do that. Uh, for instance, one of the great tragedies I think that occurred is that the ordination of clergy, which had always been something the annual conference did. The annual conference vetted, examined, received, cared for clergy. Uh, Beginning in the 1940s, late 40s, 50s, that started, the the general conference started making rules for what annual conferences could do and not do in receiving clergy. Well, the rest is history. And now if there's some good that you won't done some change that done in the church you go to general conference to do that rather than saying let's let's start here in the local church and and let's do it here uh so that that is a problem and that increases the problem that i mentioned and that is getting distracted into thinking that the key to our congregation's future is something done somewhere up there, out there by others, rather than taking responsibility uh, right here. And I think, um, I know, I also like what you said about positions. You know, if you were to ask me, uh, there's a debate going on about biblical authority. And you know, what is your position on biblical authority? Well, you wouldn't ask me that question probably because That's an impossible question to answer. I don't have a position on biblical authority. I have a keen, deep sense of biblical authority, but it's in process. It it depends on the biblical text we're dealing with. It depends on uh, my own theological commitments, et et cetera. Well, in the same way, when I'm asked, uh, what is your position on human sexual orientation? I began discussions in local congregations by saying that if we get into discussing that subject, uh, I say there's no one in this room who holds the opinion you held about this subject 10 years ago. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we've all been in process. So I I like your stress there. Uh, You know, I, I have wondered, Doug, that it, it seems to me that I wonder, I suspect that maybe our church is choosing upsides and fighting over certain issues like the ordination of clergy and, and what does it mean to be inclusive and what does, and all that, because those issues, as difficult as they are, are easier 
to focus upon than the problem that the average Methodist is 63 years old. How do you respond to that? I think that um, it's true that that the reality is in a perfect world, if the United Methodist Church stayed together, we would still have a major problem and that the decline Mm. of the denomination, um, given that every year we've seen a decrease in the number of people connected to our churches, um, since 2002, it's been a sharp decline. Um, it continues. So, so the fact that we are now experiencing um, this time of separation really is just pointing to a deeper issue that we have not, as a denomination, actually figured out how do we reclaim from our history that missional focus of um, making a difference in communities where people are willing and interested to connect with our congregations. Now saying this, of course, this isn't every congregation. There are many congregations that are doing this well, but there's not enough of them. Um, That's why the average age in our congregations is so high and why regardless of what happens, um, there's gonna be a lot of work to do Um, if we are going to continue um, to move toward vitality as a denomination um, as we move forward. You have eloquently uh, focused on this in your podcast and in the Leading Ideas work. Uh, And I I thank you that I I say if, if we had never had a pandemic that we're coming out of, if our, co- if our denomination was not thinking about separating at all, we would still have a massive problem. Yeah. And that is our church is aging. We have lost contact with now three, maybe four generations of younger Christians. That would be a problem. And I have criticized the formation of a new denomination that as I read over their documents and all, they seem utterly unaware or unconcerned about what I believe this to be the greatest concern. Uh, Well, speaking of uh, a younger generation, she'll always seem younger to me because she was a student of mine in the Duke uh, Doctor of Ministry program is uh, Dr. Livia Poole. And um, she is a local church pastor in Enterprise, Alabama, at St. Luke uh, United Methodist Church. And she did a wonderful uh, doctoral thesis uh, with us on uh, preaching and leadership. Welcome, Olivia. Thank you so much for having me, Bishop. It's an honor to be with you today. Well, thank you. Uh, Olivia, in in the book, I do a a bit of a polemic, I guess you could call it. on that that pastors, I think, I, I see two challenges for us, that many times pastors have limited their leadership to sort of caregiving, pastoral caregiving of the congregation, uh, or uh, crusading for their cherished cause. And I fear in the present moment with declension and talk of separation and all, that that both of these modes are inadequate for leading change uh, in the congregation in the future. I, or as I said in a recent Christian Century article, uh, caucusing is easy. Church, that's hard. That's right. How do you, what what are you doing in your own leadership as a pastor that you think is is working at this issue of leading in the present moment? One of the things that I really appreciate um, about the book, but also just kind of in our conversations, is the idea that your actions have to have some form of accountability. And in chapter five, you say strategy must be ruthlessly accountable to your congregational statement of purpose, Um, which 
was something that I really, that really kind of spoke to me when I read that. Huh. Um, St. Luke right now, we are doing a whole entire mission uh, or a whole entire sermon series looking at the mission of our church. And we're doing it as part of our stewardship campaign. But about once every two or three years, we take apart our mission statement and we really look at it during worship and wow. we evaluate it intentionally. And I wanted to read real quick the mission of our church. Wonderful. Our mission is to love as Jesus loves with sacrifice and obedience without judgment or condition. And in doing so, to win everyone to Christ, to disciple people in the faith and to glorify God. The mission of St. Luke was developed in the year 2000. Um, so this mission of the church is 22 years old and has continued to, to stand the test of time. Wow. We get together at the beginning of the year for um, our leadership development. I ask every committee, because, you know, we're Methodist, so we have a committee um, for everything. I ask every committee that the actions that they are taking over the next year and over the next five years need to be intentionally tied to the mission statement of our church, which allows us to have a grounding point and allows us to be very intentional in our actions and how we spend our money and how we hire our staff and how wow. we interact with our community. Um, and so everything has to go back to love, win, disciple, or glorify for us. I do think that it, there's a tendency in pastoral leadership for a uh, a pastor to either kind of be a a chaplain, maybe even a, a hospice chaplain for a congregation at times, um, or just to, to preach so such prophetic messages that you leave the congregation behind you. You gave a great example of that in your book about a a, a pastor who um, who kept on a on a on a crusade. Um, for something that they felt was very important and very intentional, but but in doing so, their congregation wasn't willing to follow them. You can only be a leader if folks are willing to follow you. If not, mm. you're making noise into a space, right? And so um, when your mission allows you to be both a caregiver, because because we're called to love people where they are, and and sometimes that means holding people's hands while they enter into the church triumphant and, and mm -hmm. grieving families. And that is certainly a calling of pastoral ministry and an important one. And sometimes it means that we're prophetic in moments where we see things that are um, concerning or we speak truth, not even from a pulpit, but just speak truth to people in a way that is filled with love when um, we see our brothers and sisters mistreating each other. Those are both callings of pastoral ministry, but I believe that they have to be tied to the mission of a local church. Mm -hmm. That to me is where, where that becomes incredibly important. Um, and then, you know. Yeah. And I, 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 I worry sometimes when we think of, we, of, as, of missions as slogans from the general conference right. or mm -hmm. even the annual conference from the top down that, that that's where the mission no the mission happens locally and the the importance of holding oneself accountable I, I love your mission statement but I also love the way you appear to be wanting to make that mission statement mean something in the way the congregation spends its money <laughs> in the way you spend your time as a pastor uh, what what's need so I think that's that's great. Uh, that, it also that, allows for accountability in a way I think is powerful. Really yeah, and you know your mission statement is a statement of what you will hold yourself accountable to. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, uh, in that mission statement that you read of your church, uh, you know it, it appears you aspire to work as a church uh, without being judgmental. I, I notice. We were talking earlier with Doug about uh, reaching younger generations. I saw the other day that in preaching, uh, if you're under 30, one of the main things that you want in preaching is for it not to come across as primarily judgmental and critical. You, you get enough of that from your parents. You know, you don't need. Uh, well, I, that sounds to me like a church trying to take seriously. Uh, what would it take for us truly to evangelize another uh, generation? You know, you know another thing, Olivia, that 
I was talking to a pastor the other day who said, um, I think we pastors during the pandemic, we had to do a lot of caregiving. Our people were fragile. Our people were vulnerable. They were having a difficult time. We had to really work at that. But she said, now that we're coming out of the pandemic, now that we find ourselves in denominational declension and all, she said, I've had to be more parental <laughs> in my ministry. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, I've had to be more assertive and say, we're going to discuss certain issues, but I'm going to curate the congregational discussion. I will not let you be bullied by certain members of the congregation that are adamant about some of these things. I will make sure that we listen respectfully, that we speak graciously. You know, and she said, I'm just, I'm having to be more parental. Anyway, I thought that was a fascinating image of changing one's style. How, how have you, do you think you have, uh, for instance, have you found yourself needing to be courageous as a leader in the present moment in a way that is notable? Um, you know, well, first of all, St. Luke is a wonderful church. I think I've told you that when we, when we've talked about this before, this is you a did? congregation. Um, and so there is, there's no one here who is a bully. Um, I, I know that my colleagues, um, certainly are experiencing that at times in their own congregations, but that's not the case here. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so I think for us, courageousness for us and courageousness in this context, although I will readily admit it is not every context at this moment, is keeping the main thing the main thing. Keeping focus. Mm. Sounds like the focus that Doug was talking about earlier. Right. Okay. Keeping focused on loving as Jesus loves. Keeping focused on winning people to Christ. Keeping focused on discipling people in the faith. Keeping focused on glorifying God. And and for us, these kind of periphery conversations about denominational stuff, we talk about it, but we talk about it in church council. We don't talk about it during worship. Um, and we've been really intentional to not do that. Interesting. We we discuss it in ways that are appropriate and we discuss it in ways that are helpful. But um, but you don't walk down the hall at St. Luke on a Sunday morning and hear people talking about that. You hear people talking about their families mm -hmm. and their weekends and what they have going on. And, um, and so it's a gift, I think, during this season to serve St. Luke. And it, and, and I'm certainly blessed by that. I you know, it's fascinating. You used the word accountability earlier, but it feels like you're holding yourself accountable to that mission statement and, and urging your people to hold themselves accountable mm -hmm. has been for you sort of liberating or freeing uh, for you. I, you're too gracious, I'm sure, to do this, but I could imagine you, someone coming up and saying, uh, 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 Pastor, have you heard about this and what they're trying to do there? And and I should we be getting on board? Should we do? And you could say, um, here's the mission statement. Let's see. How is this relevant? Because this is my job to work on this mission. How is that relevant to this mission? Oh, doesn't appear to be relevant. Well, we don't need to have this conversation, I guess. Yeah, I, I love that. It has been really helpful. I, I will say um, I'm also the chair of the conference board of trustees. Okay. An interesting place for um, to serve in conference leadership in this season. Um, That's an understatement. The, right. And so, um, you know, courageousness in those moments means having hard conversations when you have to have hard conversations and, ah. and not being um, easily offended, which which I am not. Um, and and being able to be clear and to be polite, because I think that that is an important part of what we mm. do at the moment is to try to, you know, respect yeah. each other. But then to also say, this is how this is, and this is what this looks like. And I understand mm -hmm. that you don't like it. And I understand that there's a lack of trust. And I am sorry for that, but that is where we are. Mm -hmm. And it just means having to have really hard conversations sometimes, especially when someone doesn't understand um, the financial piece or uh, mm -hmm. any number of issues. You know, one of the things I've realized. I love that mix of, of, 
being as gracious as possible, uh, but at the same time saying, uh, by the way, these are the boundaries under which we work. These are the rules. Here they are. Uh, you may not like it, but this, uh, gosh, I love though, Olivia, you're speaking of courage in terms of having difficult conversations. Uh, since my book came out, one of the most frequent emails I get from people is saying, we can't get our district superintendent or our bishop to talk about this. And I'd, I'd say one of the purposes of the book was to help you as a local church pastor to talk, to, uh, to give you some ways of framing these difficult conversations. But I love the way... And I do run into church leaders sometimes who say, well, I just think we, we ought to be gracious and affirming of everybody in these conversations. We always ought to be done with respect. Well, as the district superintendent said to me, sometimes talk like that is a cover for, I don't have the courage to have this conversation. So I'm going to say, let's all be gracious. You don't need to talk to me about it. Or that's your point of view, and that's beautiful since it's your point of view, rather than to say, let me let me try to engage you in a way that's uh, courageous. You can be respectful and truthful. And I think that I that's important. True. Uh, I hope, ooh, I, I'm, I hope in my book I managed to do <laughs> that. You uh, did. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing this book with some of my um, lay members of, of well, my church as well. But, um, but also, you know, as I was reading it, I would take a picture of it and, and send it to some of my friends that are clergy and saying, have you seen this? You need to read this, you know. Ah, uh, Olivia, what we, we've been speaking in terms of ministry and the challenges of the present moment. What do you find joyful, hopeful about ministry in the present moment? Oh, you know, I, again, some of it is is very specific to the, our context and to my context. Mm -hmm. um, I I feel so fortunate to serve St. Luke. Um, mm. I, this is my fifth year here, and I am so blessed by our staff and by our lay leadership. And I, I really cannot say enough good things about this congregation. But what do I find joyful? Sunday, we baptized a father. His three children, we didn't baptize the mother because she had already been wow. baptized. And they joined the church. And the first time they walked into our church's doors was a few months ago during vacation Bible school. Wow. That's joyful. That is joyful. Um, it feels so Wesleyan of it, you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Um, you know, we, we immersed uh, the two older boys because they wanted to be immersed. And so we did that. Oh, wow. And we have a, um, a farm trough that we use that we put in the worship space because we don't have a, a baptistry, clearly, because that's not how our church was built. So in a, in a feeding trough, we uh, we baptized these two young boys by immersion and their father by um, by pouring and the sister by sprinkling. And so it, it was a holy moment. And that's what energizes mm. me for ministry. What energizes me for ministry is people who do not have a church home, who, who don't feel like they have a community to support them to, to come into St. Luke and realize that this group of people will walk with them in their life during times of joy. And then during times of sorrow. And I think that is very true about this congregation. I will mm. tell you, when a church, when, when a family or an individual joins St. Luke, St. Luke keeps its promise to raise these children in the faith and to disciple them in the way that leads to life eternal. And it's powerful. Mm. And that's what excites me. You know, what excites me about ministry right now is the same thing that excited me about ministry when I was in seminary years ago. It is, it is the opportunity to share the love of Christ with those um, in a hurting and in a difficult world. And um, and if that's not what is exciting a pastor about pastoral ministry during any season of ministry, I, I would encourage them to really rethink their calling. Hmm. Um, wow. Could I just say to everybody listening to this, watching this, uh, did you notice, Olivia, when I asked her, her voice, her excitement 
I mean, it was palpable the way it raised. And uh, let us take Olivia as a model that the more you think about what Jesus is actually doing in the local church level, the baptism you described, not only the baptism you described, but the way you described this church's living out of baptism and their responsiveness, uh, that's exciting. In fact, I, one of the great sadnesses uh, in the present moment, I think, is to find people, I, I ask people when they're thinking about leaving the nomination or something, I say, have any of you failed to meet Jesus here in your local church? Have, have any of you uh, found that your local church is failing you in helping equip you for discipleship? Nobody ever responds, yeah. No, the, the sad thing is they, they love their local church. In fact, they don't want to be a part of a new denomination unless they can take their whole local church with them, uh, which I think is, it makes all the more sad that people are getting distracted in a way from, I noticed when I asked you what excites you, what gives you hope, you didn't mention being a conference trustee, Olivia. This doesn't um, seem to be the thing that feeds you. <laughs> no, but but I will say I do think that I have gifts and graces for this season to do that. Um, is it great. what surprises me? And what, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I think, oh, great, I've got a trustees meeting today. I can't wait to <laughs> hear what's going on in these local churches that are arguing and fighting. No, but um, but I do think I have the gifts and graces to lead that body during this difficult. Moment. Wonderful. I, I, I love the way say, you articulate that and proud of uh, your work. And uh, as you all can see, Olivia was a wonderful student. Uh, so, which is a segue. Thank you, Olivia, to uh, you. A, a current seminarian, uh, Haley Job. Haley represents the a seminarian. Uh, she is uh, from uh, she's from Virginia. She's at the Edenton Street United Methodist Church as a pastoral intern right now uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, she's a uh, finishing up uh, her time at Duke Divinity School. And I had her in my intro to ordained leadership class. Uh, by the way, when I talk to I, I have people in ordained leadership class. Talk, tell me about their call into the ministry. Uh, how does God explain your presence here in seminary? And I remember Haley said that she was a teacher of, of high school Latin. And I said, wow, I'm thinking about the Latin teachers I had. Wow. Let me just say, Haley, that there's a lot of challenges in ministerial leadership, but it'll be easy after what you face trying to push Latin into adolescent brains. Uh, Haley, uh, you know, I, I've learned by being fortunate enough to be a teacher to people like you, uh, I've learned that some of the grief that I feel in the present moment, some of my sadness at what's happening in my church, it, it's not shared by my uh, the seminarians. Some of the things I'm grieving for, they're not, they're those things didn't mean anything to them in the beginning, and that's not why they're in seminary. What What are you thinking in the present moment as someone venturing out into ministry? No, that's a great question. And so I didn't grow up in the United Methodist Church. I kind of grew up as a nun, and I came um, and joined the United Methodist Church in 2016. Um, I was baptized mm -hmm. as a baby, so that was some, um, you know, um, some grace shed, some Wesleyan provincial grace. Um, but it's been a really interesting journey for me, um, especially because it's been a time of division, not only within the church, but in our country as well. And I think my generation, especially of seminarians, see this as an opportunity to mold and shape a different church growing into the new millennia. Oh. You know, It is an opportunity for us to rethink things how can we move past just Facebook live worship? How can we do interactive online services? <laughs> How can we go out and minister in our communities to different people, um, the people that come into our own space? How can we share the word with them in a different way? 
And I think we're able to use all of this creativity that we have held within us for a long time. And it's finally just coming out um, as the church kind of splinters and makes its pathways known. Wow. It, it's interesting that when you think about dismantling and disruption, it, it can look a lot different. It, an old guy like me that is looking back on uh, years of ministry and, and all to say that church is now being disrupted and dismantled. It's different to say that to a young person who's just starting out and saying dismantling and disruption. What a great opportunity for recreation, for innovation. And uh, I, I love that. Uh, that uh, what a particularly if you are an innovator <laughs> and an initiator and uh, what to, to see that as a grand opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. You, um, what do you, and, and one other thing, you, you have not been a Methodist Christian for very long. Correct. Uh, and, I've told pastors, if you get depressed about the state of the church, uh, talk to some of your newest Methodists. Ask them, what brought you to this church? And I've been in conversations where the conversation will be fairly critical and negative. The bishops don't know what they're doing. General conference has failed us. Uh, the book of discipline is a mess of rules, et cetera, et cetera when somebody will speak up and say, hey, <laughs> I joined this church just two years ago. You don't know what a good thing you've gotten. I have been in churches that were very sure about biblical authority, mm -hmm. and it was miserable to be there. <laughs> I have been in churches where clergy didn't answer to bishops. They didn't answer to anybody. And that's why I'm a Methodist, because... Sure. There is There are structures of accountability. So I love your stressing. This can all look a lot different if, if one has discovered the United Methodist Church as opposed to somebody like me that can't remember when I wasn't a United Methodist. Absolutely. Yeah, I stumbled into a, United, a local United Methodist Church as a college student because there were two options in Davidson, North Carolina. It's either to be a Methodist or to be a Presbyterian USA. <laughs> And I fully just loved that my church, Davidson United Methodist Church, was being the hands and feet of Jesus in my community. Their mission statement wow. is that they will love God through worship, education, fellowship, and service. And as someone who was seeking a faith home, and you know, I had a lot of questions about faith, mm -hmm. um, that was the place I wanted to learn because I knew that Jesus wanted yeah. me to go out and serve and act and not just sit in the pulpit every Sunday. And that's what led me to Methodism. Uh, you talked about it in, here, I'm going to pull out the book, my good seminarian student that I am. Oh, oh good for you. <laughs> um, yeah. In chapter four, page 50, you say, the single most influential factor in the life of a Methodist congregation is its external focus. And that's what led me to be a Methodist was the work that my local church was doing. And I want came to seminary so that I can be part of that and be a leader within that as well. Yeah. I remember being in a discussion where we talked about uh, standards for clergy for ordination, which appears to be one of the major things we talk about when we gather, uh, who should be ordained, who should not be ordained. Mm -hmm. I remember in the discussion, we were talking about uh, apportion months, and we were talking about uh, uh, general conference procedures and all. And there was someone there who said, uh, has anybody ever joined a Methodist church uh, because of the things you're talking about? <laughs> right. That Absolutely. All you people have got is Jesus Christ to offer to us. Uh, and yet you're offering us all these debates uh, that uh, about biblical authority, about uh, uh, sexuality and inclusion. Uh, come on. Well, you you illustrate the power, the evangelistic power of a church being the church 
uh, focusing not on its self and internal maintenance concerns, but external concerns. Uh, you know, from your perspective, as somebody new, preparing yourself, what, uh, what do you see Jesus doing in the present moment in, in Methodism that excites you? Yeah, that's a great question. I've really been thinking in, about how God is a God of creation. So therefore, Jesus would be always creating, always doing new things. Um, and I'm really excited about how our churches are being innovative within our city of Raleigh. Innovative seems like my buzzword today. Um, but Not a bad word. Yeah, and we're focusing on <clears throat> intergenerational relationships. And that's truly where I'm seeing Jesus. Um, at Edenton Street, we participate in Wiggler worship, where our youngest saints of the church, so three-year-olds up to second Wiggler grade. Wiggler worship. Yep, it's great. They are walked out of the, they process out of the sanctuary um, to a song, and then they go and have their own worship space during the pro proclamation. And they learn more about our community and Jesus and how they can understand him and be in fellowship with one another in a space that is exactly designed for their own learning capabilities. As you've already mentioned, I'm a teacher. Mm. So I always think it's really important when we scaffold to accurate levels. And then I absolutely see Jesus when the kids come in, they come back in um, as we do um, the great Thanksgiving and they actually bring us um, the bread. A communion. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's beautiful. And it's- I love that so, pattern. Yeah. yeah, and it's showing the church like, these are our youngest saints. They are just as important as the people who are sitting on SPRC, who are sitting on the board of trustees. And we need to be pouring into them as well. So I really think I would, Jesus, uh, wow, what target. you've described. When I think about the energy and creativity that I fear is being wasted, worrying about denomination, uh, denominational creation, denominational dissolution, during a time when it appears all across the board denominations are over, uh, I think if that creativity could be channeled into creating something like you've just described, uh, how much better off we'll be. Also in listening to you, Haley, I, I've said to pastors, when you get depressed, <laughs> And these can be depressing moments for a lot of pastors. Uh, think about how you got here. Think about that person that God somehow got into your head, the crazy notion that you should be a leader and carer for Christ church. Think about that. Remember that. And that initial vocational enthusiasm. Well, what that, Remembering that can keep you going. And just you all can imagine what a privilege it is for me, uh, who sometimes gets down about the future, to encounter what Jesus Christ is doing and sending people like Haley into our church. In fact, I've said this to the students, I've admitted it, that I hear Jesus saying to me every time I greet a new class, um, hey, I'm doing all that I need to do to give your church a future. I'm sending you the right people. Now, would you try to be not so boring and dull <laughs> that you will run them away? Uh, well, Haley, thank. let's uh, bring everybody back together here now. And uh, here's a statement I made in the book. And I'd like you to respond to this statement and what about this statement do you find compelling, engaging, helpful? Uh, is God begins locally in order to save universally. Read the Bible. The future belongs to pastors and congregations who refuse to be distracted by denominational conflict or to use a pandemic as an excuse for inaction. God's future is for those who ask tough questions, come up with surprising answers, and dare better to align themselves with their core identity and purpose as the body of Christ in motion. Your congregation, for any of its faults, 
is Christ's big idea to put right what's wrong with the world. Doug says we started with you. What's your response? Bishop, I, um, I really love the quote, um, but I'm going to start with God begins locally. I, I think that that statement is just critically important. I think um, we sometimes get trapped into wanting to solve the huge problems of the world or the huge problems of the denomination. And the reality is where God has placed us is in a local congregation to do the work in that congregation. And if we actually do that work, um, we can make a difference that is going to impact the denomination and it's eventually going to impact the world. Um, but we need to have more people focus on God begins locally and we need to make sure we begin locally in our congregations and doing the work that God has called us to do. Well, a great biblical scholar said of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, Acts 2, uh, the Holy Spirit comes down from above, but the Holy Spirit works <laughs> from the bottom up. Uh, and, okay, again, Doug has used the word focus, and uh, to, to see this time as a good time to focus on what we do that. Uh, Olivia, what do you find compelling in that? Interesting. First, or I what would you challenge? Yeah, no, I, I find it very compelling. I, um, I, I can't tell you how many times I have said we do not need to worry about people that we do not know in places many of us have never been. <laughs> um, and and I think that that is very true in our context that we need to be worried about the mission and ministry of the church here on a local level denominational issues and um, denominational conflict serve as a distraction to the work to which God has called us to do and that's what I've told my congregation that's what I really believe um, is that we are called to live out that mission that I said earlier, to love, to win, disciple, mm -hmm. and to glorify here locally. Mm -hmm. You can get consumed with things happening across the denomination that you have seen on social media that are probably not factual or accurate, um, or you can choose to welcome a family who walks into our church and say, let me teach you about Jesus and let me welcome your children and let me teach your child Sunday school class and let me live out my baptismal covenant with you and with your family. And let me look outside my community, outside these the walls of this church and see how God is calling us to be in action here in Enterprise, Alabama. Um, mm. and so it, 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 it is sort of that. sad and ironic when we give events, people, reports, uh, power <laughs> over us and to say, uh, because of something they did or said, we are now leaving. Uh, I must say, too, I, I say in the book that I believe there is no criticism anybody can make of the United Methodist Church or the Council of Bishops or General Conference that I have not made before them. And my statement has been much more harsh than the way you said it. Uh, that's, that's called being church. That's called holding one another to account. That's called debating with one another just what part of Christ's mission has been assigned to us. What's wrong is to say, by the way, if this discussion doesn't go my way, or if I fail to talk you into my view on this subject, I'm leaving. That, to me, is destroys relationship, conversation, and, and even growth uh, as Christians. Haley. Uh, yeah, the word that I'm hearing is intentionality. And I've learned a lot hmm. in seminary thus far. You know, I'm in semester three out of, out of six, and I've learned the most about how to be intentional. 
with my congregants, with my classmates, and with my professors. I think that's maybe how I got this today, getting to hang out with Bishop Willimon. But that's where it comes to at the end. It's caring for these people with your heart and being in prayer with them and meeting them where they're at. Wonderful. Uh, and I'm excited that you're excited about that endeavor. And I got to say the wonder of, I can remember that wonders of, as a pastor, being in my first little rural church, and uh, I, I wondered at them and some of their attitudes about things, many of which I didn't approve of. Uh, but in my better moments, the wonder that God had entrusted me with God's people and that they were my flock and that I got to preach the word to them. And then I got to watch the Holy Spirit ignite the word among them. Uh, was great. Uh, thank all of you for this time, and thanks all of you for joining us uh, online. And um, let's uh, he here's a kind of concluding word to you that with which I conclude uh, my book, and and it's this: L let's remember together how we got to be Methodist in the first place. Our mission, our hope, love in action, all Jesus ever wanted. Let's not look back. Let's listen when he says, follow me. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Uh, by the way, Amplify Media has made three videos for Don't Look Back, the book, uh, three video teasers that you could use with a book in discussions with your church leaders or on uh, congregational retreats or for Sunday morning studies. And they are available uh, for free. And um, we've also created a leadership resource guide that you could find helpful in utilizing the book in your congregation. Uh, and you can find all of that by going to amplifymedia.com uh, to find out more about those videos, uh, the book and the related resources. Uh, thanks to all of you for being with us.